Lucky. I'll be free from child support. Time for divorce. Uh. As I was preparing for the funeral, I couldn't hide my surprise at the words suddenly uttered by my husband, John. I thought he was selfish, but I never expected it to be this bad. There's a woman I want to marry, you know. But she hates kids, so. So what? Hey, if Kevin stays alive, they just keep taking money for child support and medical bills, right? Wow, what a relief. How awful. I felt my internal temperature drop sharply. To think such a guy was Kevin's father. My mind sharpens, and simultaneously my stomach churns. I agree to the divorce. Right. Then I'll take this house, so get out quickly. Can you wait until after the funeral, at least? Guess I have no choice. Saying that, John went out somewhere. And on the day of the funeral, I read out Kevin's will. John turned pale, and the relatives glared at him with faces like demons. Well, it's time to strike back. My name is Michelle Eddington. I'm a 42-year-old homemaker. I used to work at a company doing translation work, but now I've switched jobs and take freelance translation gigs. My husband, John, is 45, three years older than me. I married him when I was 29. He was in charge of dealings with our company's clients. Our son, Kevin, was born the following year, but John is a very selfish man and never really participated in child care. Kevin was very frail constantly in and out of hospitals from the moment he was born. I often felt sorry, wondering if I could have given birth to a healthier child, but Kevin diligently underwent treatment and managed to hang on for 12 years. His condition worsened around his 12th birthday, during his first rainy season. His cough wouldn't stop, he couldn't eat and his fever wouldn't go down. I hurriedly admitted him to the hospital, but despite the drip, his symptoms didn't improve much. Mom, I'm sorry for being admitted again. You don't need to apologize for that. You'll get better, right? Yeah, I'll do my best. Kevin said weakly with a smile. My eyes welled up at that smile, but I couldn't cry in front of Kevin. I desperately held back my tears. While Kevin finally slept a little, I called John. But no matter how many times I tried, the call wouldn't connect. Was he out on business? I stopped calling and switched to texting. It wasn't until the next morning that I got a reply from John. Seeing the content, I immediately called him. John picked up the phone on the first try this time. What's up calling so early? Don't what's up me. Why aren't you here? Kevin is fighting for his life, you know. Well, even if I go, it's not like his illness is gonna magically disappear, right? Besides, we're gonna rack up more hospital bills, aren't we? Beds aren't free, and tell the doctor to give him discharge as soon as possible. What? How can you say that? Oh no, can't hear you. Anyway, I'm off to work. Hey, wait a minute. John hung up without even listening to my plea. Sure, John had always been indifferent towards Kevin, but he had never said anything this awful before. I clenched my smartphone tightly, trembling with anger. 
Even as the rainy season ended and summer began, Kevin's condition didn't improve. The doctor told us that it was uncertain if Kevin would make it through this winter, so I saved my work and tried to stay by Kevin's side as much as possible. Mom, you've been staying with me from morning till evening lately, but is your job okay? It's fine. I'm working from home properly, so don't worry. If you say so. Kevin seemed unconvinced, wearing a troubled expression and speaking in a voice that hinted he wasn't entirely satisfied. Knowing Kevin's gentle nature, he was probably worried that I had lost my job or that I was inconvenienced because of him. After that conversation, to avoid causing Kevin any more stress, I started bringing my laptop and working right in front of him. Kevin lugged books and spent a lot of time reading during the day. He also enjoyed studying and would participate in the hospital classes when he was feeling well. I had wanted to let Kevin do everything he wanted. However, John seemed very dissatisfied with me in that regard, not only failing to visit Kevin, but also constantly complaining at home. Hey, why hasn't he been discharged yet? He's got a private room, right? It's such a waste of money for the bed and everything. How can you say that when our son is fighting so hard, why don't you visit him at least once? I'm busy, okay. You're enough for the visits. John consistently refused to visit with such an attitude. Even though he was Kevin's father, Kevin must have felt lonely. I thought so, but I knew there was no point in forcing him to go reluctantly, so I couldn't push it further. By this time, John often came home in the early morning after drinking, and he always smelled of alcohol when we met. He said it was a business dinner, but seeing lipstick stains on his shirt from the laundry and receipts from hotels used for breaks in his suit, it seems like he's cheating. He can't make time for Kevin, but he has time for some other woman. Although my affection for John had run out, divorcing him would only sadden Kevin. That's what I've been enduring. Amidst this, Kevin's condition worsened. I get called in by the attending physician and heard something shocking. I'm sorry, but he has about a month left. What, doctor, can't you do something? Beyond this. As I collapsed in tears, the attending physician assured me we'll do our utmost until the end. And for about two weeks, we continued treatment in consultation with the attending physician, but as expected, Kevin's condition continued to deteriorate. I'm almost, huh? What are you talking about? There's still so much you want to do, right? Saying that while encouraging him, I shed tears where Kevin couldn't see. And finally, when the attending doctor told me that treatment was no longer meaningful, I decided to discharge Kevin to spend his final moments at home. I get to go home. That's right. The doctor said it's okay for a few days to change the mood. Yay. Even though Kevin weakly returned with childlike words, I desperately held back my tears. I informed John about it, but he just said, oh really, and casually went out somewhere. This guy is hopeless. I completely gave up on John. The discharge is scheduled for tomorrow evening, so I rushed to prepare the house and complete the discharge procedures. And finally, as I was packing Kevin's belongings, Kevin spoke up. Hey, Mom, 
Do you like dad? Up. At the sudden question, I stopped in surprise. Kevin, without paying attention to my reaction, continued speaking. Dad isn't interested in me or in you, Mom. So, if you don't like Dad, I want you to divorce him and live as you should, Mom. Kevin. Kevin must have realized that things weren't going well with John. But as a parent, I couldn't let my child worry like that and face his end. Thinking quickly, I put on a smile and replied, What are you talking about? I like your dad. Your dad cares about you and me. He's just busy and can't come to see us often, that's all. So don't worry, okay? But, yeah, you're right. Kevin didn't seem entirely convinced, but he stopped pursuing it further. Beside Kevin, who fell asleep soon after, I let out a sigh of relief. And then, two days later, Kevin passed away peacefully at home. Until the end, John never showed his face, and I kept holding Kevin's hand, staying by his side until the very end. Kevin, Kevin. As Kevin's body grew cold, I clung to him, crying out loud as I recalled everything from the time he was in my womb until now. The nurse who had looked after us since childhood came along with the attending physician. They mourned with me and then explained the subsequent procedures and arrangements. Then one of them took out a letter from a bag and handed it to me. This is from Kevin. He said to give it to you if something happened to him. From Kevin. I took the letter and bowed deeply to the attending physician and the nurse. I couldn't thank them enough for their kindness in supporting both me, who had been alone without John's help, and Kevin, who suffered from illness. After they left, I opened a letter beside Kevin. The contents made me gasp in astonishment. What is this? Along with expressions of gratitude to me, Kevin's letter contained something shocking. I read it and it made my blood boil. Even while the funeral director was there for arrangements, my mind was consumed with thoughts of the letter I had just read. Still, decisions needed to be made, and I proceeded to arrange a small yet intimate funeral for Kevin ensuring it would be homely. Then, the day before the funeral, John finally showed up, still reeking of alcohol as always. I no longer had the strength to confront him. As he nonchalantly grabbed another drink from the fridge, he remarked, You look older. Tomorrow is Kevin's funeral. Where were you? Just working, as I've been saying. Always complaining. Why did I ever marry this guy? No, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have met Kevin. My mind was a mess. Kevin's not in this world anymore. Oh, I forgot about that. His attitude, like he lost some distant relative or something just got my blood boiling. However, there's no point in arguing with someone like him. Thinking that, I decided to confirm the arrangements for tomorrow's funeral. Lucky. No more child support. Let's get divorced. Up. Uh, while preparing for the funeral, I couldn't hide my surprise at the sudden words from John. I always knew he was selfish, but I never expected this. I found a woman I want to marry, but she hates kids, so. So what? With Kevin gone, 
I won't have to pay child support and medical bills anymore, right? Well, that's great. How awful. I felt my temperature drop sharply within me. To think this guy was Kevin's father. My mind cleared, but my anger boiled over. I agree to divorce. Right. Then I'll take this house. So get out quickly. At least wait until after the funeral. Can't be helped. Saying so, John went somewhere. And on the day of the funeral, I read Kevin's will. John turned pale, and I glared at him fiercely while he looked helpless. Now it's time to strike back. The will I read exposed John's infidelity. Until the funeral started and I began reading the will, John pretended to be a grieving father who lost his beloved son, wailing inconsolably. So, why would you have such a letter? No, that's not it. It's a lie. It's Kevin's prank, right? Michelle, I've been busy with work and couldn't come to see you often. I felt sorry about that, but there was no need for this. John was trying to deceive even at this point, and it was quite pitiful. I wordlessly took out the envelope from my bag and thrust the photo in front of John. What the? Are you taking secret photos? Is there anything to worry about being secretly photographed? Like if your relationship with the person you're seeing within this photo got exposed. Oh, no. With John stuttering and turning pale, I smiled and asked the relatives to pass around a few photos. Words of disgust leaked out from various places along with small screams. Despicable. Not even visiting his sickly son and fooling around with this woman. The stares at John became even harsher and he slumped down where he stood. I handed him the divorce papers. With a sudden lift of his head, John looked at me. And then he clung to me with a voice that seemed about to burst into tears. Because you never took care of me. It was just a fling. Please forgive me. I don't want a divorce. Not taking care of you. You're not a child anymore. And didn't I ask you several times to take care of me together? It was you who kept using work as an excuse to avoid it. But taking care of someone is dirty. The moment John said that, he vanished from in front of me, and I realized he was crawling on the floor. Next to him was a figure of my father-in-law taking deep breaths through his shoulders. What do you mean by calling nursing your own son dirty? Cut the crap already. A parent who doesn't take care of his child isn't a parent at all. It's the lowest of the low. Ronnie and Jillian, my in-laws, had been doting on Kevin since he was born. They celebrated every discharge with meals out bought Kevin things he liked, and, of course, never missed visiting him in the hospital. They probably never imagined their own son could be so heartless, especially since he had been making excuses about being too busy with work. With tears in their eyes, my in-laws stared fiercely at John without bothering to wipe their wet faces. It must have been the first time John had been hit. He held his cheek in surprise, looking stunned. Michelle, I am so, so sorry. If I had known he is a man who would hurt his own son, I would have divorced him immediately. I'm truly sorry. As my in-laws began to apologize to me, I hurriedly stopped them. My in-laws had done nothing wrong. 
Kevin loved my in-laws dearly. And the reason I didn't divorce John was because of them. Ronnie, Jillian, you two are not at fault at all. Look, even in Kevin's letter, he wrote thank you to both of you, Grandma and Grandpa. Stay well. Both Kevin and I love you guys. Michelle, thank you. I'm sorry, Kevin. Oh my. Jillian hugged me tightly and started sobbing. Ronnie, with his head down, was shedding tears. On the other side of my in-laws, John seemed to finally come to his senses. Suddenly getting up, he pointed at me and shouted, What the hell? Why are you guys apologizing to this woman? She's just an old hat. She's nothing but a failure of a wife who can't even handle her husband. John, hey you. Yikes. I stepped in front of John, stopping Ronnie from lunging at him again. Despite my smiling face, John, trembling, tried to maintain dominance by glaring at me. What's up? You got a problem. Not really. This is reality. There's no one here on your side. Also, make sure you return the money properly. You've borrowed money from various people, haven't you? Why are you bringing that up? My words made the relatives who had lent money to John uneasy. After reading Kevin's letter, I had been contacting relatives. It was because the actions John had taken, as heard from Kevin, were quite costly. The woman John was involved with was in the entertainment industry, loving flashy things like buying branded goods and traveling abroad. Because of this, John had been footing all the bills, but his salary alone couldn't possibly cover it all. Realizing this, along with informing them about Kevin, I confirmed if anyone had lent money to John. It turned out that not only John's relatives but also my own had lent money under the pretext of Kevin's medical expenses. At that time, he had vaguely promised to express gratitude and return the money, but in the current situation, the relatives who had lent money seemed to realize that John had been using the money not for Kevin's sake, but for his affair partner. Don't mess with me. I lent it to you thinking it was for Kevin. Return the $10,000 right now. Same here. Return the $20,000. With these words as a starting point, Demands to return borrowed amounts came from various directions. John, pale-faced, looked around at those voices. Then he turned to me with a smirk. Michelle, we're married, right? You'll help me out, won't you? Ha, huh, what are you talking about? You don't care for Kevin. You don't even cover his medical expenses let alone living expenses. You've borrowed from everywhere and used it for your own selfish desires. Unbelievable. There's no way I'll help you. Don't say that. With a pathetic voice, John slumped down again. It seemed he had no energy left to argue anymore. Looking down at John like that, I called out towards the entrance to deliver the final blow. Sophia, please come in. Sophia, what are you doing here? John, with an expression that seemed like he was about to collapse any moment, finally looked towards the entrance. A woman called Sophia approached me tentatively, her demeanor filled with fear. With minimal makeup, she looked far more modest than in the photos. I called for you. On Kevin's final day, I was hoping you could persuade the girl who was with him to attend his funeral. Um, well, 
I'm sorry for what happened. It's okay, don't bother with superficial words. Upon hearing my response, Sophia immediately shut her mouth tight. Her complexion, much like John's, was as pale as a sheet. I handed her a document as she reached me. I called you here today to sign this document. Please read it carefully and sign it. Um, $50,000. I can't afford this. It's not for you to decide whether you can afford it or not. As I said that, Sophia looked at me with pleading eyes. Although irritated by her gesture, I had no intention of confronting her about it at the moment. Then, trembling, John stood between Sophia and me. What? I'm at fault here. So, can't you forgive Sophia? It's just too pitiful to dim in such a huge amount like $50,000. Why, I'm just asking for compensation for your affair. John raised an eyebrow at my words and let out a heavy sigh. While internally screaming that I wanted to be the one making that gesture, I waited for John's next words. So, Sophia is weak, unlike you. How do you expect her to earn $50,000, selling her body? You're such a despicable person. John. John, reveling in Sophia's adoration as she clung to his back, seemed enchanted. I wasn't the only one observing the two of them mockingly. Even if I keep quiet, he'll still be pounced on by relatives. But hey, let's throw another log on the fire here. Your son is hospitalized, right? Son. Sophia's shoulders twitched in surprise. I continued without pause. Your son is the same age as Kevin. Seems like he's been hospitalized for quite a while. Your ex-husband took custody, right? It's tough, isn't it? Hospital bills, medical expenses, not to mention the cost of the bed. Besides child support, they're probably demanding quite a sum, aren't they? Why bring that up? Sophia stared at me as if she were seeing a ghost. John, still frozen in surprise at Sophia's words, remained motionless. I took out documents from my bag and handed them to John. After trembling violently, John pushed away Sophia, who was clinging to him from behind. Eek. What's the meaning of this? Divorced. With a kid. I didn't sign up for this. Wasn't it about needing money for your family living far away? I didn't lie. My son is also family. Was I just dating an old flame? What happened to true love? Was it my money you were after? Weren't you after my body too? Saying so, Sophia took off her shoes and hurled them at John. John, furious, lunged at Sophia. The security guard, summoned by someone, intervened as the two started grappling like children. Approaching the disheveled pair with a smile, I spoke up. John, make sure to sign the divorce papers and pay the alimony. Sophia, you won't get a single penny less for your alimony. Also, from your ex-husband, infidelity is no longer just a mere flaw. It's a sickness. It seems like you're seeing a few people, but if you have that much spare time, we'll enforce the alimony, the overdue child support, and the medical expenses. My gosh. John remained silent hanging his head, while Sophia was led away by the security guard, shoulders slumped. I apologized to each of the relatives for the commotion, 
and they all kindly comforted me, tears streaming down my face. Later on, the divorce with John was finalized. We reached an agreement on the alimony amount as per the claim. This incident greatly angered both sets of parents-in-law. Furthermore, the relatives were furious about being deceived, leading to a complete fallout. It seems that the amount he embezzled was demanded back all at once, and it seems he borrowed from some shady sources. For repayment, he reportedly worked multiple jobs every day, but the repayment amount was too high, leaving him with no living expenses. Finally, unable to pay off the interest that had swollen, he was taken away by some scary guys last month. The parents-in-law don't seem to intend to file a missing person report, hoping only that he is safe, but they secretly wish he would suffer immensely, if possible. As for Sophia, she was caught cheating on every man she dated and having a child, leading to the termination of all financial support. Though she's 30 years old, being considered old for the hostess industry, she couldn't attract customers. So in the end, she relied on her parents and transferred all the alimony at once. However, afterward, she was sent to a farm on some island where she is forced to work with all her wages going toward repaying her parents. As for me, I moved with Kevin's portrait. I purchased a house near the sea that Kevin always wanted, and I live alone with a cat he wanted. Sometimes the parents-in-law come to visit, and reminiscing about Kevin is one of the pleasures. After that, I received another letter from Kevin addressed to me separately. In it, Along with many expressions of gratitude, there was an apology for leaving for heaven ahead of me, and the content that he wanted to be my child again even in the next life was written in slightly shaky handwriting. And at the end, it was concluded with Mom, you just keep being you, stay lively, and live long which made me determined to live my life true to myself for Kevin's sake. Overcoming the sadness of not being able to see the growth of my beloved child, I will continue to live each day to the fullest 